the voice of Alabama politics with your host, Bill Brett. Now, the number one political show in Alabama, The V. Welcome to The Voice of Alabama Politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and as always, I'm joined by The V Team. Welcome all. Good Good morning. And we are live at the Mid-Alabama Republican Club. How about that? It's great. We have a lot of distinguished guests here. We have a long list of Republican uh, policymakers and folks that really make it happen. And we are certainly thrilled to be among such good Alabamians, such patriot, patriots of our state. And Claire, looks like a good bunch, doesn't it? That's right. We've got senators, uh, judges, House members, national committee men. We've got a great crowd here. Uh, don't no, forget our production team over yes, here. Yes, I got to remember Jonathan Barbie. There's our producer. Our producer, uh, uh, Joel uh, Brewer. Brewer, is our technical guy, and Brandon Mosley, our senior reporter, is in the back with his Auburn cap on. <laughs> uh, it has been a terrible week in politics, a very interesting couple of weeks in politics, as we have seen our state and national news about Governor Robert Bentley. Yesterday, uh, prior to a, or after a, uh, a meeting in Mobile, there was a press gaggle at which they asked the governor again about his relationship with Ms. Mason and what that means to our state. Claire, I don't know if you saw the tape. I did. You saw the tape. The governor seemed uh, like the person we've never seen before. He seemed a little angry. He snapped at the reporters. That's not going to go well. Well, I mean, he was a little... Frazzled, and basically he said, he kept saying, we're here to talk about jobs, and they were signing a bill down at the port of Mobile, and he said, this is not, they, get, they kept asking him, the reporter kept saying, does this harm us in the state recruiting business, and he kept saying no, and she said, is this question relevant to, it? she kept saying, this question is relevant to what I'm asking you, and he said, it's absolutely not. I think if I had been in his position, I would have just given him one clip and moved on down the road, but... Um, he, he was I didn't think he was that bit out of shape. Uh, Susan, you've talked to other reporters. You, you are a reporter. You Did know you? what it's like to be in one of those press gaggles. What was your impression? My impression was that some uh, his staff should have been there for him uh, at that time. Those are very, very uh, crowded arrangements, and he got very angry with the reporter, even to the point of pointing at them. I don't think that's really going to play well with the Capitol Press Corps. Unfortunately, they've loved Governor Bentley up to this point. However... Uh, reactions like that don't usually go very well. I will say you're correct. I did notice in watching that clip on Channel 5, there was no staff other than no. security around him, which is highly unusual for a governor. Jack, this is something you know a lot about. Where are his surrogates? Why aren't they in front of the cameras? Well, he's run everybody off, I think. <laughs> I mean, I mean, y'all report he doesn't have any families withdrawn from his friends. Um, he's not really the only person he's been getting advice from for the last year and actually listening to was Rebecca Mason. And now that she's resigned, I'm, I don't think anybody, and, and he never wanted to have a chief of staff. Remember, right. after uh, Seth Hammett left, it was a little triumvirate of young kids basically around him. And he said, well, we're gonna, they're kind of going to share the duties. So there's no central figure of authority who's advising uh, Bentley. I, I saw... Bill O'Connor and Seth Hammett having dinner the other night in Montgomery, and they walked by me. I said, is this the damage control team? And they looked at me like, well, well maybe. And uh, so I don't know who he's, I don't know who he's listening to. And that's the question that we've, we've asked, and we've asked the governor's office, and that is, who, who is advising you, and who is your help in a time of crisis? Now, and that's really uh, one of the things that concerns us, uh, I want to move on to a, a little bit of something else that uh, surrounding this is that you know you have a lot of speculation about impeachment and the proceedings of impeachment. From all we can tell right now, impeachment looks DOA, but it, it 
It hasn't lost its legs, has it, Susan? It hasn't. <clears throat> There's a lot of fervor out there for the impeachment proceedings to go forward. However, they're not really sure, from my understanding, of how to do that yet. So what they've planned to do is come back with another impeachment bill and assign it to a committee. Of course, anybody around the legislature knows that's pretty much the death of the bill right there. Uh, however, there's a lot of pressure out there, so we'll just have to wait and see. And Claire, we, we understand that Spencer Collier, which is kind of where all this started once Spencer was fired, he came out with a lot of information and, and the tapes came out. We understand now that Spencer Collier will be filing a civil suit against the state of Alabama. Uh, for wrongful uh, uh, termination because he was fired because he was going to be, a, he was a witness. Uh, he signed an affidavit that went to Matt Hart. It was first reported that it was under duress. It was not. He told me himself he voluntarily signed that affidavit as a law enforcement officer. But there, there's going to be more revelations if Spencer files this thing, and I think it's going to happen this week. Well, I think, you know, <laughs> personally, uh, as a longtime Republican, you know, the governor is the governor of our state, but the bottom line is there has been no formal, there may be an investigation going on by the U.S. Attorney's Office and maybe something going on by the Attorney General's Office. But until the governor is proven guilty of something and has been, has an indictment of something, you know, I, I think he still remains in the governor's office. You know, I hate to say this, but we have plenty of men and women that are elected and a lot of them have lived in glass houses and have thrown stones. You know, is it right? Is it moral to have, is it right to have an affair? But, you know, the governor was divorced. You know, I, I say put all this relationship, sex scandal, you know, all that is sinuous and people love to hear about it. And when I worked in the TV news business, you know, if it bleeds, it leaves. Like if somebody dies or there's a sex scandal or something horrific like that goes on, people love to talk about that sort of thing. But the bottom line is, has the governor has he tampered with witnesses, and has he obstructed justice? And we don't know the answers to those questions yet. People may assume that, and that may be, but to me, everybody's innocent and proven guilty. I mean, I think that everybody, of course, you know, we have plenty of legislators and senators sitting right here. They're the ones that can tell you more about the impeachment process than we can. But we have somebody that is sitting as a speaker at the Alabama House, and he's got 23 criminal indictments. How can we ask for the head of our governor when he has not been indicted on anything yet, other than the embarrassment and the sex scandals? Oh, go ahead, Jen. Um, the governor, you know, the, the, the sex issue aside, and we don't know that he did, but God knows it sounded like it. Um, <laughs> well, if he didn't, he missed it. That's why I didn't wear my earring this morning. I was <laughs> nobody's offended. And, um, Claire groped me on the way in just for all time. <laughs> and y'all know um, better than that. Yeah. <laughs> and you think that tape was repulsive? <laughs> yeah. No, what, where Billy has to worry is what Claire said. Obstruction of justice. Did she ever take the state airplane when he wasn't on it? Uh, did troopers drive her around? She was not a state employee. When they went out of town, did the state pay for her hotel room and her meals? and her alcohol if she drank. I mean, these are the questions that an investigation is going to show. The pure sex of it, though we don't like it, is not, and to me, and maybe I'm wrong, an impeachable offense. Mm -hmm. But, and, and while we don't like it and it's repugnant and all that, you know, it happens all the time. Can you spell that? Not really. Okay, repugnant. <laughs> I'll have to turn to Susan on that one. One of the things, though, Susan, that I, I, we do what we call the Walmart poll. You know, Susan and I live in rural Alabama, uh, and, and the only place that's to shop is Walmart. And so when we go to Walmart or we go anywhere in our, our little community, we ask folks a couple of questions lately. Uh, and, and the question comes back, the answer comes back to our question, what was he thinking, and why is he still governor? I mean, the people, uh, the other day, Governor Billy said, the people of Alabama love me. And I have to say, I'm not even sure most of them like him anymore. And the reason being, and I'm, I'm being honest, because we live in rural communities, and be honest, I hate to see this, but Susan, uh, the governor promised us that he was a Christian. He, he t sold us on the fact that he was a nice human being. He could be trusted above Bradley Byrne or Tim James, that he was more conservative and all this stuff. 
And now the folks are saying, well, he may not have had sex, but he was kind of inappropriate. Well, I think the biggest problem that, and, and do understand that they, they can grasp the governor's affair. It's very difficult. The, the Hubbard affair is very, very complicated. So this is something easy for them to grasp onto. But I think the biggest problem is, is as one of them told me, is, well, whether he did or he didn't do this, when he got up on, in that press conference, I feel like he lied to me. I feel like he was treating me like I was stupid. And I think that's going to resonate, unfortunately. Well, one of the things we learned is that that press conference was sort of ad hoc. We're going to have to leave it right there. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back. came up and we got a question about this and I, I see some folks that might be uh, affected by that. There's a bill sponsored by Senator Arthur Orr that would uh, change the way that uh, 501c4s have to report uh, what he says is this is about transparency. 501c4s are sort of their gun pack is a 501c4. Uh, John Rice's uh, Alabama uh, for well, limited government, Alabama yeah. Foundation, Alabama Foundation for limited, for limited Government. government. Uh, Senator Dale Marsh has two 501c4s that he used during the 2014 campaign. And what I, when I spoke to Senator Orr, he said that the 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 bill is a constitutional amendment which would allow legis the legislature to regulate how much money you can give and how much uh, you can spend and who uh, is giving money to 501c4s. Now, the rainy day patriots are 501c4. People are concerned. I talked to uh, Sean McCutcheon, who y'all all know is the guy who, who led the charge against uh, aggregate campaign getting, giving, and I also spoke with the Citizens United, and when I said that the, the Republicans were trying to pass a bill that would make disclosure of 501c4s and limit their ability to spend and raise money, they said, well, the Democrats don't even have any power. How are they trying to get this bill passed? And I said, no, it's the Republicans. And, and the, the people at Citizens United said, if this bill moves one more inch, we will be on the ground in Alabama. But Claire, there's a reason for transparency, but these, these 501c4s are used by all kinds of folks, especially Tea Party people and and people that want to change big government. Yeah, it's very interesting because the sponsors of the, these bills are Mike Jones, who's from South Alabama, who's chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and then Arthur Orr from Decatur, who's also a lawyer. And it's very interesting because, as we know, most of these 501c4s, all this is really regulated at the federal government, not the state government, okay, not at the state level. So I think they're treading on thin ice, and I'm not really sure why... Senator Orr is behind this, and I, Senator Wagner was just here. I wish that he were here. Maybe he might have some insight for us behind this. But, you know, what's good, what, good, what is good, good for the goose is good for the gander. So I'm not really sure who they're trying to unveil and why this is coming about, but it just does not seem like a Republican thing 
that we'd want to do. Jack, I mean, we've seen in the past that when you get absolute power, you start targeting the other the people that might take you down. Well, that's what happened to Becky Garrettson up in uh, D.C., you know, with, with her group getting targeted by the IRS. Now, does this mean the Policy Institute would have to... Disclose their names if, as well? If there's 501c4, that's what he's saying. Isn't that Everybody what they are, the disclose. Alabama Public Policy? I don't know if they're C3 Alabama or C4. Institute. I don't know. I don't know. They have to be a C4, but, I would but think. the Rainy Day Patriots would, John Rice would, anybody. Del Marsh's groups would. Del Mar well, when I asked Senator Orr about Del Marsh's group, he just laughed. And I, I, he brought up John Rice's group as the only group he mentioned by name. And he said, we don't want people like John Rice running against us in primaries. And I'm like, but it's okay for somebody else to do it? I mean, this is really, I think it's about control. It's about who gets the message. You think about the rainy day patrons, the people who give them money, they don't want to be targeted by the establishment, right? Right, right. Who's, who's going to be in charge of selecting who has to reveal their donors? That's not anywhere in the bill. They, you know, it, as the far way it's as written it's, right now, it can just be random. I want to see your records, but I want to see your records because you're against something that, that uh, I'm, I'm for. But you're okay because you're on my side. That well, really, really concerns me. Well, there's part of me that thinks it, it almost may be unconstitutional to do this. Okay, if if, you, if you're a 501c4 across the board, you're going to have to do it. You cannot go hand select and choose this because the federal government has standards and the states law is not going to supersede the federal government. Well, according to Senator Orr, when I spoke to him, and he was pretty angry about me revealing that he had this this bill, uh, he told me that uh, that he had talked with, with Ockney Lathan at uh, LFO, and that they had found a very narrow path which they could use so it would it would be uh, untouchable federally. But uh, it's, a, it's a great It's concern. dangerous. It's egregious. Yeah, you have to. You get paid for saying that. Say it. <laughs> no, I wish I got paid for it. I don't, but I do say it all the time. Susan, uh, Claire always says egregious, right? She always says egregious. Every show, you can count on it. Set your watch by it, at uh, least once. One of the things that, that we've heard that may happen, you know, there's this, there's this hole in Medicaid. Five one C three. And and the governor wants to fill it. Well, part of that hole is really to expand the RSOs, the regional RCOs, uh, RCOs, the regional. Uh, Care organizations. Care organizations. And that, that requires the biggest chunk of the money he wants to, to raise. Uh, now, we, we don't, we're, there's no appetite to raise taxes. Uh, there's no appetite to raise the trust fund. So what other options are left, Claire? Are there any? Well, I mean, as people have seen floating around there, particularly the members that are sitting out here, I mean, there's been all these local gaming bills, and the one is um, Senator McClendon has got the lottery, lottery bill. bill. And from everything that I have seen, particularly over the last, I would say, 15 months, it seems that people do have an appetite to let people vote on a lottery only. It seems, you know, adding all these gaming entities into it, they're not for that, but just for a straight lottery. From what I've seen, people are for that. Uh, Jack, do you, is that the sense you're giving? I know we ran a poll some time ago. Yeah, in the lottery, there's, there's a lot of favorable support for the lottery. Um, the problem with McClendon's bill, though, is it only creates a lottery. It doesn't say how it's regulated. It doesn't say who's going to regulate it. It's too open-ended, and y'all remember when Siegelman did this in 99, was it 99? I think it was. 99. It went down in flames. Now, I think one of the reasons that Siegelman won as governor that year, beside the fact that Bob James kind of lost the fire in his belly, was that Siegelman proposed the lottery. But once people studied it and said, well, wait, this is too open-ended. Who's going to make the money? How, which brothers-in-law are going to get rich off this deal? And it went down. A lot of the preachers got after it, and it, and it failed. And that's what we have to worry about when you just have a loosey-goosey bill that's written. Uh, F, for the record, uh, API is a 501c3. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, Jack, that, that McClendon says and the, and the lottery experts say is that the only way to get a lottery bill passed is to get it passed like it's a blank slate because it is the details that kill the bill with the people because you have all these special interests. You have this special interest that wants to be this way, that special interest that wants to be that way. And so it is generally said, and I spoke briefly with the guy who's written a lot of these, these uh, laws, and I can't remember his name right offhand, and he said 
This is why they die, is because you put too many specifics in there. The specifics should come back at, under the legislature so that you don't have to have a constitutional amendment every time you want to change the game. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I don't trust the legislature to come up with the rules. <laughs> well, the deal is, is you have a, the lottery bill, and then you have to have enabling legislation, right. which the legislative body would have to pass the enabling legislation. Sure, right, exactly. So that's, that's how it would have to happen. But that's, uh, that's the way, why it is the way it is. We've got about one more minute in this segment. Uh, Susan, you took exception. I know this would take you longer than one minute. Uh, with Mrs. Mason saying that uh, Spencer Collier talked to her because of her gender. You want to address that just oh real briefly? Lord. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Just, Why did you yes, do I, it? I went on kind of a rant about that, and I want to apologize because there's too many women in, in, in the professional field that have worked too hard to get where we are uh, on our intelligence, on our education, on our talent. For this woman to have done what she's done to get to where she is and then try to play that card. I'm sorry. Our membership does not include that qualification for getting to where we are professionally. Okay. So. Well that, I'll pass it <laughs> you better the reason right I wanted to bring, one of the ones I wanted to bring that up is because around 150,000 people across the United States read her article and her email box was flooded because, look, as... Uh, you know, women have worked very hard to stand next to men, especially in uh, uh, this, this day and age when it shouldn't be anymore. You know, so I, I, I commend you for doing that, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everybody that uh, reached out to me through email. It was very nice. It was very supportive. And we, we really do have a team out there. Claire, you concur? Well, yeah, I concur because I've, I've been a professional woman for a long time and was felt like I was paving the roads when I moved back in 1995 working in state government. With you Governor were doing James. more than paving them, girl. Well, I was, <laughs> but uh, I was going to say just because there's a somebody had put in a request to ask about the parental rights in House Bill 112 that Matt Friday had, and I really cannot answer that. I would ask for you to ask Mr. Standridge or, or Mr. Danny about that uh, because I don't know where it is. I know that it's up not until April the 13th in Judiciary Committee, which is very, uh, you know, we're, we're down to nine days after Tuesday, Legislative Day, so I do not think, I'm not real optimistic. And we're going to have to leave it right there. You're watching the video, the <laughs> voice of politics. The way you that. that is standard issue right there. <laughs> In 1977, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. The odds of that same boy then making it to the US and European pro golf tours, one in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the US Open twice, one in 1.2 billion. The odds of him having a child diagnosed with autism, one in 88. Ernie Els encourages you to learn the signs of autism. special today. We're glad to be in Vestavia with the Mid-Alabama Republican Club. Thank you all for having us and thank you for joining us. There has been a lot of talk and it seems like we're going to see action on an $800 million bond issue to build more prisons. We know that our prisons are in tough shape. Susan and I have toured many of the prisons here in Alabama. The first one we toured, uh, I said, do you want to stay at home? She said, oh, no, you're not going anywhere. I'm not going. If you're going to be locked up, I'm going to get locked up with you. <laughs> but our prisons are terrible places. If you've never toured an Alabama prison, they are awful places. But prisons are not supposed to be luxury. Uh, but we're, we're, again, and this is just my opinion, we are going to borrow $800 million, Claire, to, uh, to build prisons when uh, there's so much lacking in infrastructure and everything else. Uh, how do we pay for all this stuff? They say it's savings, but we don't have any details on this bill. Yeah, this has been very controversial. You know, and the, somebody asked the question, do, are these four new prisons needed? So I actually would look to maybe the justice and ask him that. But um, reality is very controversial. This is an $800 million bond that we're putting on the backs of my children, many people's grandchildren. And the, the thing about this, it was not very um, transparent because uh, the 
contractor, the architect, the engineer, all these firms were so have been in a back in a background group. They've all been selected. Of course, they had all their big meals and lobbyists up there so trying to pass this bill, which passed on Tuesday night, probably around 7:30 or 7:45 Tuesday night. And I just think, uh, as I've kind of joked and said with everybody, well, I wonder how many people will go to prison, get indicted over this in the next 10 right. years, because it just does not smell right. It doesn't look like right, and there's not the transparency in, in this. And there's just a lot of other issues that we're facing. One of the issues, Susan, is that we don't even know where they're going to be built or who's going to build them. <clears throat> I was a project manager for years doing Internet projects, and the first thing you do is make a plan. This is what concerns me about this bill. Not only do they not have a plan, there are no studies available for how much it will cost in the end. They don't even know where the locations are going to be at this point. We're just basically saying, okay, eight, here's $800 million. Y'all go do with it what you need to do. Uh, that disturbs me very, very much so. Well, Jack, you know, we repeatedly asked uh, DOC, we asked the governor's office for specifics, and they have never replied to any of these requests, uh, I mean, uh, what happens next? I mean, and again, we need to bring up the fact that this is basically no bid contracts. Yeah, they're no changing bid. State That's the law. biggest issue, yeah. yeah. They're changing state law, so these are awarded these are awarded contracts and not, not bid out like the normal process. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. They've already negotiated this with these particular contractors, architects, and engineers. That's already been done under the table as opposed to no bid, which is egregious in my mind. And we have another no bid controversial issue with the Department of Finance sure. in contracting with a $47 million, $47 million contract to, that was not bid. Right. And it all it, what it did was it was uh, basically to pay bills with. That's how you pay the bills. So we spent $47 million. Because so many vendors who do business with the state in high dollar figures are not getting paid back in a timely manner because the state's broke. And right. they hired this company on a no-bid contract for $47 million to help collect that money, and they weren't prepared to do it. No. I mean, it, so anytime there's a no-bid in Alabama, I would suggest you grab your wallet. Yeah. <laughs> you just, you just, that is too much. $800 million, and like Susan said, they don't even know where these prisons are going to be built. They haven't bought the land. Are they minimum or maximum security? They haven't told us anything. So well, all we know is we're getting four prisons and we're going to refurbish 13. I mean, we need new prisons. There's no doubt about it. But it's how, how do we get there? I mean, these are not very conservative notions. They aren't. And what they're doing, as opposed to the old model of different contractors submitting an RFP, a request for proposal, they're calling this a design bill, where they're essentially saying, oh, it's okay, we'll just pick an architect and a contractor, and they'll go in and they'll just, you know, they'll, they'll figure it out, and it'll work better that way. But at what point do you, does the contractor go, oh, you want electricity in there? Oh, you mean, oh, oh, you wanted fire, you know, fire safety? How about bathrooms? How about bathrooms? Oh, geez, you wanted toilets in there. That's going to cost you a little more. So that's the kind of contract this would be. Well, and the thing that, you know, if we look at what happened up here with the Beltway, that, they were trying to get that done that way, and then they came in and it had to be build, bid, and, you know, we saved uh, in this area millions and millions and millions of dollars because it actually went through the bid process. What this, this design build is been used on, being used on a federal level. That's pretty much all I know. This is the biggest way to do it on a federal level. Uh, there, have, there are no studies... I mean, there are plenty of studies that will show that this is a good idea in the private sector. Government is not the private sector. There's, there's studies and actual law that, or cases that show that this wasn't a good idea in the, in the public sector because cronyism, it, it wasn't done to, to, for efficiency. It was done to pad somebody else's pocket. Uh, Anything else we need to talk about? Well, I just, there was somebody who had asked the question I did about, you know, if the governor were to step down, the lieutenant governor would become the governor, and who would be the next lieutenant governor? When that happens, there is not a lieutenant governor. Uh, Del Marsh would just be preside over the Alabama Senate. There is not a lieutenant governor. He would preside over the Alabama Senate. That's how that works. Well, we want to thank you all for having us here today and being a part of our show. And Jonathan, we'll have this up soon. We'll, we'll notify everybody when the show is online. We want to thank you for watching The V. You watch us because we watch them.